Good morning, everyone. The flowers on the altar are given to the glory of God and loving memory of Geraldine Jerry Shyrock, um, whose birthday would have been January 31st, and it's from her family and friends. On Sunday, February 13th, we will be taking a collection to benefit the Meadville Soup Kitchen and all donations, uh, if you're writing out a check, should be made out to Meadville Soup Kitchen. Is that correct? Okay. As far as events this week in the congregation, we have morning prayer on Tuesday at 7 a.m. in the Henderson Lounge, and then Bible study in the evening at 6.30, or I'm sorry, at 6 p.m., and that's entirely over Zoom. It's no longer... Uh, in both places here and on Zoom, so just Zoom. And one more announcement, as we go to worship, uh, there will be a change in our hymns. So the praise hymn is now going to be the closing hymn. And it is well with my soul will be our praise hymn. Let's turn our minds and our hearts to worship with this call to worship. It's from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 2 to 6. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered, go and tell John what you see, what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Dear Lord, we thank you for this confirmation in your word of who you are. We pray that your presence would be with us, that we would sense that and worship you for who you are. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, our opening hymn is, And Can It Be That I Should Gain, page 260, number 260 in the hymnal.
Okay, uh, you have to sing loud today. <laughs> um, so, it was that high E that was getting me at the end. <laughs> it's pretty tough. So, all right. Um, our Old Testament reading uh, this morning is Isaiah 35. I'm just going to adjust this a little bit. Isaiah 35. We're still in Mark's gospel. We're looking at chapter 7 and the closing verses of that, 24 to 37 today. And um, we have what, what I think at the end of those verses is an echo of Isaiah chapter 35. And Isaiah chapter 35 is about God's restoration, a time when uh, his presence will be with his people and nature itself will reflect that, it will rejoice, and the people will be healed, the nations will be judged, um, and the people of God renewed. So we see that here in Isaiah 35, and in Mark's gospel, we'll, we'll talk about how uh, one who is deaf is, is made to hear, his ears are opened, and his speech returns to him. So um, I'll read chapter 35 here from Isaiah. Hear God's word. The wilderness and the desert will be glad, and the Arabah will rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It will blossom profusely and rejoice with rejoicing and shout of joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Encourage the exhausted and strengthen the feeble. Say to those with anxious heart, take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come, but he will save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be open and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. For waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the Arabah. The scorched land will become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals, its resting place, grass becomes reeds and rushes. A highway will be there, a roadway, and it will be called the highway of holiness. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for him who walks that way and fools will not wander on it. No lion will be there, nor will any vicious beast go up on it. These will not be found there, but the redeemed will walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion. With everlasting joy upon their heads, they will find gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Here ends the reading of God's word. And now what we will do, we haven't done this for a while. This is a responsive reading. And so in your bulletins there, you'll see this, these are uh, first five verses of Psalm 32. And Psalm 32 is a Psalm of David. Psalm 32 is about acknowledging um, Sin. David is acknowledging sin before the Lord. Some think this has to do with the event with Bathsheba. Psalm 32 here um, will recite these words together. Uh, it's responsive, so I'll start. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. 
my vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to thee and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and thou didst forgive the guilt of my sin. Okay. And so now we come to our time of prayer. And this is, as we have just recited there, it is a prayer of confession of sin and the seeking of assurance of pardon. And so um, it's also a prayer that is intercessory. We pray for those who are on our hearts and minds today. You have the list there on the back of your bulletin, um, but it is an intercessory prayer as well. So I'll give you a moment to pray silently, and then I'll lead us in prayer, and we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, as we come as your people this morning to worship you in spirit and in truth, we come now to acknowledge our sin before you, to seek your forgiveness, to acknowledge those things we have done which weigh us down way upon our hearts and our minds, the way we have served ourselves rather than you, looking out for our, our own benefit rather than the benefit of others, the ways we have failed to love as you have loved us. We pray, O oh Lord, that you open our hearts to these things, that we may not be silent, that we may acknowledge openly what we have done and that we might find forgiveness, that we might find relief from guilt, a weight that is lifted, renewal in our hearts and spirits, that we may find you to be our hiding place, the one who preserves us from trouble, the one who surrounds us with the songs of salvation. We pray, O oh Lord, that you instruct us in the inward parts, in the ways that we should go, that we may walk in them to glorify you that we may know that you are our God and we are your people, that you keep us, that you strengthen us, encourage us, give us the ears to hear, give us the voices to praise your holy name. Let us do it here in worship, let us do it in the privacy of our own homes. Let us do it in the marketplaces. Let us do it before friends and coworkers and before family that we would praise you. Father, we also pray for those who are on our hearts and minds today. And we mention a few. Father, we do think of Janet and her family as they grieve the loss of Ted. We thank you for the fellowship we had. We thank you for the families coming together. We thank you for the meal and the opportunity to talk. 
Lord, we pray in this way, not just for Janet and her family, but all who mourn the loss of loved ones. We pray for their grief, that you would comfort and that you would take their cares into your hands. Father, we pray also for those who struggle with illness. We think of those who face cancer and the therapy that goes with that. We pray, O oh Lord, that you keep them, that they would know your merciful hand upon them, that you would bring healing where it is according to your will. Father, we pray for Jim, who is about to have surgery, and we commit him to you, that you would comfort him even now, that you would encourage him and strengthen him. We pray for that surgery to go smoothly and the healing to be quick. Give him strength. Father, we pray for Barb, we pray for June, we pray for Elaine and Ron and Susie, we lift up Rosemary, and we think of all who struggle with isolation, loneliness, and meaning and purpose in life. We pray, O oh Lord, for each one here, that you would renew our purpose in serving you and serving one another. We thank you for the opportunities that come. We pray for our relationships to one another, to our family members. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would bless. We thank you for new life. We thank you for our children. And we pray for them and our children's children, even yet unborn. Father, we thank you for all of these things. And we commit them to you, along with the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Okay, I'm all I'm I'm lost now in the bulletin. The bulletin's a little different this week with the reading. Okay, um, so it's young people's message time. Young people's message. All right, and guess what? We're talking about we're talking about something we've talked about before, but it's in our text, and I think it's a good reminder to have. Um, and the idea is this, the word is this metaphor. Do you remember what metaphor means? Metaphor. What is a metaphor? A way of comparing one thing to another uh, because they have similar characteristics. So you're comparing one thing to another. The metaphor does it directly. A simile which you may have thought about, does it with the word like. So you say like or as with simile, but a metaphor does it directly. And it is a figure of speech, a metaphor. It's not to be taken literally. In fact, you could probably get into trouble if you take it literally. So depending upon the comparison, it can be quite effective. Can you think of a metaphor? Can you think of any metaphors that you may even use Right? What? Did you have one? <laughs> You've got your mouse ears on, huh? Okay, well, all right. Um, so how about this? He is a bull in a china shop. Have you ever used that one? He's a bull in the china shop. Do you know what that means? Now he's not literally a bull, right? But okay. So uh, what about this one? The judge holds a kangaroo court. What does that say about the court? She is a wolf in sheep's clothing. His room is a pigsty. Right, Thomas, is that true? Okay, <laughs> do you resemble that? Okay, <laughs> what happens if you try to understand these things literally? It doesn't, it's not gonna go well. Um, so they become nonsensical and, and you actually end up missing the point. As a book, the Bible uses these types of figures of speech. It uses metaphor. And so it's important for us to understand these kinds of things because we're going to encounter them so that we may read the Bible rightly. So can you think of any biblical metaphors? How about biblical metaphors? There's some that stand out, right? How about... Behold the Lamb of God, right? What about this uh, Lion of Judah, right? Our text today has a couple metaphors in it. So I want to see if you can, you know, find those metaphors, pull those out, look at those, listen to the text, listen to the talk, and then um, afterwards I'll ask you about them. So see if you can find those in the text. And then, you know, I'll ask you about what, what are they and what are they describing? What, what are these metaphors communicating? So what would be the treat? Well, again, of course, we're dealing with the Lion of Judah, so it's got to be the Kit Kat. Everybody likes Kit Kats. Those seem to go like that. So there you go. All right, um, listen for that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the young hearts and minds who are reading your word, who are discovering in that word just the many literary styles and, and devices that are, that are used there to communicate to us. And you use these things. We are your people made in your image. And we pray for these young folks as they open your word and read it, that you give them understanding and wisdom. We pray that not only for them, but for each one of us, for we ask it all to the glory of Christ. Amen. Okay, so now we come to our scripture. Our scripture passage this morning is this, it's Mark chapter 7. And we are reading verses 24 to 37. Mark chapter 7, verse, starting in verse 24 and going to the end of the chapter. Okay. 
See if I can fit everything on this podium. Okay. So starting in verse 24, follow along if you're willing and able. Chapter seven of Mark, starting in 24, Jesus got up and went away from there to the region of Tyre. And when he had entered a house, he wanted no one to know of it, yet he could not escape notice. But after hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of the Syrophoenician race, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he was saying to her, let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered and said to him, yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. And he said to her, because of this answer, go, the demon has gone out of your daughter. And going back to her home, she found the child lying on the bed, the demon having left. Again, he went out from the region of Tyre and came through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee within the region of Decapolis. They brought to him one who was deaf and spoke with difficulty, and they implored him to lay his hand on him. Jesus took him aside and from the crowd by himself and put his fingers into his ears. And after spitting, he touched his tongue with the saliva. And looking up to heaven with a deep sigh, he said to him, Ephatha, be opened. And his ears were opened and the impediment of his tongue was removed, and he began speaking plainly. And he gave them orders not to tell anyone, but the more he ordered them, the more widely they continued to proclaim it. They were utterly astonished, saying, he has done all things well. He makes even the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Here ends the reading of God's word. God's plan to redeem his entire creation, this great plan of redemption, great plan of salvation, and pattern of redemption or pattern of salvation is to address Adam's sin through Abraham's calling and promises. Promises to be a great nation, to have a land, that God will be their shield and protector, and in turn they would be a blessing to all the nations. It is through Israel that God would heal the nations. Salvation is from the Jews. Mark chapter 7 provides us a taste, as we have already seen. This entire chapter, just the beginning we looked at last week, provides us a taste of fulfillment and how the messianic promises will include the Gentile nations. So as we look at this section of chapter 7, one thing I want us to take away is this. Jesus, the Messiah, brings the bread and healing of his kingdom into the Gentile territory. Jesus, the Messiah, brings the bread and healing of his kingdom into Gentile territory. And that is your world and my world. 
What's our context? We're continuing in Mark's gospel, the good news of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And last week, we saw how Jesus was confronted by a delegation of Pharisees and scribes from Jerusalem, even, regarding his disciples eating without washing hands. And the Pharisees, in their oral traditions, taught that all Jews should follow the ritual cleansing, the ritual washings that were prescribed in the Old Testament for priests alone, and one of those being hand washing. Jesus called them out on their hypocrisy, on their play acting, pretending to represent God outwardly when inwardly all the while they plot and schemed against him. They were working against God. Jesus gave an example of how they taught their disciples to escape honoring father and mother, defrauding them of what was rightfully their support. A relationship between parent and child symbolized that between God and his people. Jesus then told a parable about what makes a person unclean. And with this parable, Mark summarizes that Jesus thus declared all foods clean. And we see in this how the disciples still struggle to understand and how the door is opening to the Gentiles. Jesus is not abrogating the food purity laws, but fulfilling them. And when the reality has come, the sign pointing to that reality is no longer needed. So with that background now, Mark records two events in Gentile territory. So I'm going to break these into two sections, and I've given you an insert in your bulletin, a literary structure for each one. This is what we call um, a chiasmus. It's kind of like, uh, you know, a sandwich with the outer bread and the meat in the middle. There's two different ones here. As we look at these sections, I'll describe each, each of these. One's called a chiasmus, where it goes A, B, C, and then CBA back out again. So it crisscrosses. And then the next one is called concentric. It has an unmatched center. So you have A, B, C, B, A, that kind of thing. Okay, we'll talk about it. The arrangement of the text here, as we look at these verses 24 to 31, the arrangement of the text helps the reader or listener in understanding what the writer intends to emphasize. And some of these things we just pick up naturally in our own conversations. Uh, these things sometimes occur just naturally, but other times they're intentional. And so when we look at this, um, we see this pattern, this A, B, C, C, B, A pattern. And we see the themes of Jesus here, entering and leaving a Gentile home. That's the outside part of it. And then we see, as we move closer to the middle, the unclean spirit present and then gone. And then when we get to the center section, here we have the bread that satisfies the children first and then the dogs. Okay, that's kind of the structure. Um, but as we look at the structure, the structure may help us to understand what the writer is intending to emphasize but there's also the very text around it that gives us, it's, it's the plot, you know, it's the salt and the pepper and the spices that go with it as to how this thing comes to pass. These verses are about an encounter with Jesus in a Gentile home. We don't know what is actually happening here. We don't see the disciples. Jesus is going to a home. Is he seeking solace? Is he seeking to be alone? Or is there something else going on? All we know is Mark tells us he goes to this home in a Gentile territory in Tyre, and it's the region of Tyre, and some of your Bibles, may, mine just says Tyre, but there's a note that sometimes it'll say Tyre and Sidon, okay, so you may have that, you may not, but we know he's in this region, and this region is a Gentile territory, 
And what may have, I think even Josephus said, these, these are some of our worst enemies in terms of the Jews, okay? So we have to understand this context. So he comes into this home, and these verses are, an, are about an encounter with Jesus in this Gentile home, and then the central section here drives the theme, that is the bread that satisfies all who partake, that is children first, and then we see the crumbs given to the, the dogs, or what we might say are the Gentiles. The themes of unclean and clean, and then eating again, this bread, these things connect us to the earlier verses of chapter 7, to that previous section regarding Jesus declaring all foods clean, and therefore opening the door to the blessing of the Gentiles. The interaction here is remarkable. Jesus does things that a Jewish rabbi or a Jewish teacher wouldn't do, just wouldn't do, wouldn't enter a home in a Gentile territory, wouldn't speak to a woman, you know, nevertheless, the, the, the Syrophoenician woman, I mean, even more so, wouldn't speak that way, wouldn't interact. These are things that Jesus is, is doing. He's breaking culture here, um, breaking boundaries, and he's doing these things. So the interaction is remarkable. He enters the home, he engages a Gentile woman in conversation. Yet in the conversation, Jesus speaks as a Jew would speak. So he does these things that are not characteristic of a Jew, but then he's gonna use language that is typical Jewish language, right? Essentially calling the woman, her daughter, and Gentiles in general, dogs. Dogs, that's a metaphor. Very curious. Another curious bit is that the woman, after hearing of him, that is Jesus, who's in the house, after hearing this, immediately comes and falls at his feet. What does this woman know about Jesus? It's a scene similar to the synagogue leader. You remember Jairus? who comes and is, it's his son, I think, or no, is it his daughter? I think it's his daughter who dies, right? Yeah, so it's very similar to that, isn't it? But he's a synagogue leader. Here is a Gentile Syrophoenician woman, and she comes on behalf of her little daughter. She falls at his feet and persists in asking him to cast out the demon from her daughter. Jesus says, so again, here we are in the midst of an unclean situation. I hope you see that. I hope you understand that the reason the Jew wouldn't enter a Gentile home, wouldn't speak to a woman, wouldn't speak to a Gentile woman is because of the unclean situation. But here we are with an unclean spirit and a little girl, and this mom wants him to cast it out. Jesus says, let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. What do you think of that? What does he mean? Let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. How do you respond to that? The woman's response is absolutely amazing. Yes, Lord. But even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. Jesus is, who are the children? The children are, is Israel. So Jesus is talking about the kingdom itself, the bread of the kingdom, that feeding is to go to Israel first, not to the dogs. But he does say, right, he does say to the children first, let the children be satisfied first. So there is an opening there that something is going to come to the dogs. And the woman says, yes, Lord, but even the dogs get the crumbs, right? 
Even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. Yes, Lord. What does she know? We got to ask that question. What does she know? Does she, is this simply a, a mom who is absolutely desperate? Or does she have some clue about the plan of salvation? How it would come to Israel first, but Israel would in turn be a blessing to the Gentiles. What does she know? Is she aware of the Jewish Messiah and the promises? All nations will be blessed through Israel's Messiah. Does Jesus use such terms to intentionally elicit a response? And he said to her, because of this answer, go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. Jesus simply says the word and the unclean becomes clean. So there's a couple things to note here. You know, when we look at the structure itself, what's at the center of it? At the center of it is this conversation between Jesus and the woman. Now, sometimes we think well, this is about casting out an unclean spirit. Well, nowhere do we see the unclean spirit cast out. It's more that we hear about it's already done. And the center part of it is this conversation between Jesus and the woman about the children and about the dogs. That seems to be our focus. It is the plan of salvation. It's emphasizing that here is the Messiah and he's coming even to the Gentiles. I think the woman is desperate, but is also aware of the promises. I think Jesus used the language of dogs with a little bit of sarcasm. Mark set the scene with he wanted, to, he wanted no one to know of it, yet he could not escape notice. I think Mark includes this comment, and we're going to see it at the end of this whole section. It's all about this. Jesus is trying to keep things quiet, and yet they will not be quiet. And Mark seems to not even regard this as attention, whereas we're looking at it. Why is he being quiet? Why does he want people to be quiet? And why are they ignoring him and just going on and telling about it? That to us seems like attention. At least to me, it seems like attention. But Mark has no problem with it. He just simply states it. And that's where he leaves it. But maybe he is emphasizing here that what Jesus was doing was impossible to keep hidden. If these don't speak, the very stones will cry out. That kind of a thing. And then we come to the next section and Jesus remains in Gentile territory. He leaves the region of Tyre and Sidon. And where does he come? He comes to Decapolis. This is an area of 10 cities. And it is a Gentile area. So we're looking at verses 32 to 37. He's been here before. We know that he's been in the region uh, of Decapolis. Do you remember when? It's chapter 5, and it's about the man with the legion of demons. And these verses show yet another structure, literary structure, with a single unpaired point at the center. And I said this type of literary device is called concentric, and the center position here often marks the climax and turning point of the story. So in this event, Jesus's words, Ephatha, be opened, change the situation. We start with one situation, we come to the center with Jesus's words, and then we come through that and the situation is changed. So those outside parts of the structure inform the reader of the situation. There's an anonymous Gentile man. We saw an anonymous Gentile woman in the previous section. Now we have an anonymous Gentile man who is deaf and unable to speak or speaks with difficulty. That word may go either way. The Greek behind it may go either way. Either he's unable to speak or he just speaks with great difficulty. You can't understand him. That's the point. Jesus takes the man aside. He pulls him aside. He places his fingers in the man's ear, and it says he spits and touches the man's tongue with the saliva. So it's likely he spits 
on his own hands and touches the man's tongue uh, with that. How would that go over today? Huh? <laughs> so anyway, this is what he does. This is a little different than we've seen before. He doesn't say it. Well, I mean, he says something, right? He says, Ephatha, and be opened. But the man is unable to hear. What about the touching? What does that say to the man? You see the human touch. He does this. He touches this man. He puts his fingers in his ears. He spits on his hand, and then he touches the man's tongue with his saliva. So the man wouldn't be able to hear Jesus' word, but he could feel this his touch. Jesus looks to heaven. He says, be opened. The man's ears are opened, and literally, what's literally said here is the bond or fetter that has got his tongue bound is loosed, and he began to speak correctly or plainly. And then Jesus brings this man who was living in silence into a new world, of hearing and speaking. And what does he do? He tells him not to tell anyone. <clears throat> it seems this passage here is all about silence and speaking, right? Silence and, and singing. And here it is, you know, <laughs> he tells them not to tell anyone. But the more he tells them, the more they proclaim it. And they were utterly astonished, saying, he has done all things well. He makes even the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. These words are perhaps here an echo of what we read from Isaiah 35. that speaks of a time when there would be a new exodus. This is what Isaiah talks to. I mean, this is what he's on about his prophecy is about this, a time when there would be a new exodus, greater than the first, creation itself rejoicing, the nations being judged, Israel being restored. It is a picture of the messianic age. If you remember the text, it says, they will see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Then the eyes of those who are blind will be opened and the ears of those who are deaf will be unstopped and the tongue of those who cannot speak will shout for joy. These things in Isaiah 35 are about Israel's restoration renewal. But here in Mark 7, it's in the context of Gentiles. So here we see the fulfillment what we began earlier with the food purity laws being fulfilled and opening the door to the Gentiles, here Jesus opens it even wider. And his ministry is going to go that way even more. A few points of application. Mark continues to fill out a response to the question, who then is this Jesus of Nazareth? Authority in teaching, casting out demons, healing, authority over nature, even authority over death itself. He calls the 12. He declares all foods clean. He's reconstituting. He's redefining Israel. And now he goes even to the unclean dogs, the Gentiles. And he, in essence, shares the bread of the kingdom with them. To the Jew first, then to the Gentile. But his kingdom will certainly include the nations. In the anonymous woman and anonymous man, we may find our own stories. Jesus has come and is capable of opening our ears to his revelation and giving us the ability to sing his praises. In Jesus, Yahweh's kingdom has come into the world, a world of pain in which he brings love and healing, renewal, and it's available to all. Jesus, the Messiah, brings the bread and healing of his kingdom into Gentile territory, and that means into your world and into mine. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you for all the ways in which we behold your glory in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. 
we realize now we can no longer speak of you apart from him. Lord, help us with our own sin. Open our ears, open our eyes, give us the voices to praise you and not be silent, but to do it more and more, all to the glory of Christ, for we ask in his name. Amen. I think this is where we have the closing hymn, right? Is that the... <laughs> And this is our jumbo insert. What did David Werner call it? I think he called it the jumbo insert. All right. There is a fountain. It's in the key of A, so it should keep us, you know. Cool. People of God, receive the blessing that comes from our God. May the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.
Gott.